Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. My name is Mary Dasso, and I'm a senior investigator in the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I'm very excited to be able to introduce today's speaker, Yukiko Yamashita, who is a pioneer in the study of genome organization and function, particularly in the male germline. She will be presenting the 2023 Margaret Pittman Lecture as part of the Wednesday afternoon series. The Pittman Lecture is given by a researcher dedicated to advancing the improvement of careers of women in science. Since 1994, uh, when this lecture series began, every speaker has exemplified the intelligence, scientific excellence, and drive that made Margaret Pittman a leader as the first female laboratory lab chief at NIH. Um, and I want to point out that Dr. Yamashita was nominated for this honor by the uh, NIH Women's Science Advisors. It's a great honor to have Yukiko Yamashita with us today. She's currently an HHMI investigator and professor of biology at MIT. She's also a member of the White in Whitehead Institute, where she holds the Susan Lindquist Chair for Women in Science. She began her scientific career at Kyoto University, where she completed her bachelor's degree and then pursued a PhD in biophysics in the laboratory of Mitsuhiro Yanagita. Uh, she then pursued postdoctoral work with Shinichi Takeda and Margaret Fuller at Kyoto and Stanford, respectively, before establishing her own independent lab at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She became a full professor in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology in Michigan, where she also held a professorship in the Life Sciences Institute and was the director of the Michigan Life Sciences Fellows Program. She moved to MIT in 2020, where in addition to the titles that I mentioned earlier, she serves as the co-chair of the Biology Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Dr. Yamashita's work has broadened our understanding regarding fundamental aspects of multicellular organism, including how cell fates are diversified via asymmetric cell division and how genetic information is transmitted um, through the germline. Her work has been particularly important for the elucidation of the structure of genomes, exploring such important questions as the nature of satellite DNA, previously considered to be genomic junk, and how it might contribute towards speciation. She's also uh, worked, her work has also brought applicability to understanding asymmetrical cell divisions, as well as questions regarding the immortality of cells within the germline, and I believe she's going to address some of these questions today. As you would expect from such an out scientist, outstanding scientist and mentor, uh, she has earned very many honors along the way. A select subset of these awards including, include the American Society for Cell Biology Women in Science Early Career Award in 2009, a MacArthur Fellowship in 2011, the Suniko and Rei J. Uh, Ozaka Award from Nagoya University in 2016, and being named as a fellow of the American Society for Cell Biology in 2021. She's also currently serving as a Board of Scientific Counselors members, member for the uh, NICHD intramural program. So without further ado, the title of uh, Yukiko's talk is Germline Immortality and Asymmetric Stem Cell Division. And once again, because they want me to emphasize it, the CME code is 44455. So with that, Yukiko, thank, welcome very much to the NIH, and thank you so much for being here. So I'm really excited to be actually back to Morris Lecture, and thank you so much for the invitation. So today I'm going to tell you something uh, that it took 10 years for us to get a, some sort of the framework or, you know, the, what we are tackling. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, a, that's a quite a journey, but I, um, I'm very excited to share. And I, as a, almost an excuse, I always put this quote from Barbara McClintock, I doubt it could have been anticipated. <laughs> Uh, so she's, of course, referring her discovery of the transposons, but uh, I mean, many things are really, uh, you know, the totally, un, you know, unexpected in science. So today, uh, I'm really, you know, going to tell you about, you know, the germline immortality. And so if you really think about, and then, you know, the, take a moment to think about this, it's quite remarkable. Uh, if you, you know, the, you're talking, when you're talking about just the somatic cells, um, you know, any cells in your body, and even actually yeast, uh, you know, can divide up to 30 times, and then they actually undergo replicative senescence. So in the face of this limited, you know, the lifespan for any kind of the cell, um, it's quite remarkable to, uh, sorry, yeah, 
to think about this Jamra lineage, right? You know, the you, each one of you used to be a germ cell from your parents just, uh, you know, the several decades ago. The, and then your parents were also, you know, the, uh, the again, you know, the two germ cells in additional a few decades or several decades ago, and then it ke keeps going back. And then during that journey of the germ cells, germ cell never stop the seizing. That's why you are here, we are here. And that means germ cell lineage actually lasted this 1.5 billion years of multicellular multi life. And what enabling this is kind of a really fascinating question. And you know, the, the big question of the today's lecture is how germline achieves this immortality. And of course I don't have a full you know answer to it, but you know the something you know that my research end up is leading to a part of the question. Um, so this you know the research started more than ten years ago when I was very new as assistant professor at the University of Michigan. So this idea of you know the non-random sister chromatin segregation has been out there quite some time, and then there was a little bit of confusion in the field. Um, so the first, let me explain what it means by non-random sister chromatin segregation. So here, you know, as you can see, there's a DNA double strand that, that as everybody knows, you know, the plus strand, the minus strand, or you know, you may call it the what strand, the click. So during the DNA replication, these two strands are going to uh, be separated from each other, each of them serving to temperate the, you know, the newly synthesized strand. So plus strand will temperate the minus strand, minus strand temperate the plus strand, right? So this product of DNA replication is called uh, sister chromatin, and they are supposed to be identical from each other. And then that's the whole point of the DNA replication because if DNA replication, you're not copying you know, the, from the template every time you divide, of course, you know, the soon enough, either you're gonna be you know, completely dead or you will be uh, you know, something completely different, right? Uh, despite this idea of the DNA replication being completely you know, the precise, uh, there was an idea that you know the one sister chromatin might be associated with something unique, such as epigenetic marks or replication-induced mutations or whatever you know, there's something else. And if that kind of you know, some special information is associated with only one sister chromatin and then goes to only one daughter of the cell division, that might lead to you know, asymmetric cell fates. That's been the idea. However, this idea has been highly controversial, and then there's many papers, uh, you know, the studies that supported this idea, and then some refuted this idea. And when, you know, the, my first graduate student, uh, she really wanted to test that idea, and then tested uh, this possibility as a bulk DNA, like all the strand versus new strand of the entire genome, she saw no evidence for this. But the same student, this was Yadarapari, currently assistant professor at the University of Michigan, really wanted to get to the bottom of this phenomena, I mean, to address the possibility. And then she came up with a pretty, you know, the really good, you know, the method she could address this with the highest resolution possible. So in this method, you know, the way, you know, the DNA replication is happening, you're gonna, you know, to put the BRDU, nucleotide analog, uh, during the DNA replication. When that happens, only newly synthesized strand is going to be BRDU positive. And once DNA contains BRDU, those strand, uh, uh, strands are like 500 times more sensitive to certain wavelengths of the UV. So after you dissect out the tissue and they fix the sample, you could irradiate those dissected tissue and then nick them. And then if you nick the newly synthesized strand, you can digest them away. That leaves only older template as a single stranded DNA. Now you can differentiate these two strands by strand specific probe in a different color. So you can tell which cells inherit the, uh, you know, the size three probe or you know, the one red strand and just inherited the blue strand, right? And then, so this method called the co-fish, central chromosome orientation uh, fish has been 
developed, you know, the 10 years prior before Swasti decided to do this. But she decided to actually design a probe that is a chromosome specific. So she was able to design, you know, the X chromosome specific probe in the red and the blue and the second chromosome specific probe in red and the blue, etc. And then we do have a nice tissue system, which is Drosophila male germline stem cell, where we can identify stem cell and its differentiating daughter coming from the single stem cell division at the single cell resolution. So we know within a tissue, which is a stem cell, which is its immediate daughter. And in this context, so you can apply the fish and then you can see which strand, red strand or blue strand, went to which side of the stem cell division. So when she did this, so this is what we get. I mean, this is a, uh, just an example. And as I said, you can identify stem cell and the differentiating cell always at the single cell resolution. If stem cell gets red and then the other side gets blue, and of course you, you can also have you know, the alternative, you know, the uh, pattern over here as well. So when uh, you know, the Swasi did this call fish with chromosome specific probes for all chromosomes, and then so this is what she got. First, in theory, if DNA strand are indeed exact copy of each other, it shouldn't matter. Stem cell gets a red strand or blue strand, right? I mean, it shouldn't matter. That's the whole idea of the um, the DNA replication. So then. These two patterns should be observed at the equal frequency, like 50% and 50%. That's what you expect. However, in the real experiment, when she take a look at the X chromosome, you know, the sister chromatid segregation pattern, Y segregation pattern, second chromosome segregation pattern, etc. then first, you know, she saw striking bias in the segregation pattern for just the X and the Y chromosomes. And at the beginning, of course, we worried that this got to be some sort of, you know, the artifact because this shouldn't be happening, right? Um, however, uh, when we did the exact same experiment for the autosomes, there's no bias. So then maybe this is not, the, you know, the, some sort of technical artifact. There's something is going on. But at that point, like 10 years ago, we had no idea how this is happening or why this is happening. And then, you know, the main part of this talk, I mean, you know, the 10 you today is like you know the, the the journey of the ten last ten years. So then you know the back then you know the then new postdoc you know the George Watase who's re just left actually this this week. Uh, this week was his last week, and then he's heading to his next semi-independent position where he can do all of those his independent work, um, continuing this work. But when George started. First thing he decided was, okay, we should really map some sort of chromosome-specific element. When we started this project, I mean, only one assumption we made was that there should be some sort of chromosomal element because this was a chromosome-specific phenomenon. So then, you know, the, to make a long story short, you know, just starting from an X chromosome, when George deleted this big chunk of a heterochromatin called the BB chromosome, uh, you know, the, then the X chromosome without this region uh, was segregated completely randomly. So we thought, okay, there's something in there. So what's in there? You know, the, the history of the Sophila genetics already gave us the answer. There was two elements. One was ribosomal DNA, the other one was a satellite DNA. And if anybody asked me to bet my money on either of those, I would have absolutely said a satellite DNA, which is exactly what I did. And now we study satellite DNA, right? But for this particular case, you know, I was wrong, and it turned out to be it's ribosomal DNA. And uh, so the, that answer came from by looking at the Y chromosome. Uh, so Y chromosome also happened to have ribosomal DNA. And if you, you, you know, there's also the chromosome that deletes this Y chromosome uh, ribosomal DNA. Such Y chromosome also segregated randomly. And we really didn't know what to make of this because ribosomal DNA, you know, the, you know, the, this is not even specific to anything, you know, that has a sex chromosome, right? I mean, it, we, we were very, very puzzled. But we had to say it, this kind of makes sense, logically speaking, because two autosomes that we knew do not segregate non-randomly do not have ribosomal DNA locus. And more recently, 
when George take a look at the translocation chromosome where second chromosome uh, got a Y chromosome fragment that contains ribosomal DNA, that second chromosome now segregates non-randomly. So now it's really ribosomal DNA. And from there, um, so, I mean, by identifying ribosomal DNA, and we also narrow down to the specific element within the ribosomal DNA, which I'm gonna come into a little bit later. But then, okay, so that is a cis element we finally have. So from there, I mean, it took like about five years. Uh, you know, George isolated a protein, which we named Indra. So this Indra was isolated based on its ability to bind to ribosomal DNA, but we later, found that this is also required for the non-random sister chromatid segregation. So we have now, in addition to the sister element, we also have a trans factor that seems to do something about you know, the, um, the non-random sister chromatid segregation. But we didn't know the biological significance. Like, you know, you have a molecular mechanism for something that you don't even know the, you know, the meaning, right? So that was a kind of a weird situation, and what is the difference uh, between the two sister chromatids. Even when we know it's ribosomal DNA, after ribosomal DNA replicate, they, that should be the same ribosomal DNA, this side and that side. What is the difference, right? That's another still, you know, the remaining lingering question. So to address this question, we ha I have to step back a little bit to explain what the ribosomal DNA looks like. So ribosomal DNA is a tandem repeat of the many, many copies of the ribosomal DNA gene or ribosomal RNA genes. So why is it? Because if you look at any of your cells, uh, like 80% of the entire transcription within a cell is to generate ribosomal RNA. So for that reason, you cannot just live with a single copy of ribosomal DNA. So that's why you know the every single you know the multicellular organisms has hundreds of hundreds of sometimes you know the thousands of copies of ribosomal DNA tandemly repeated, and in case of Drosophila, about 200 copies on each X chromosome, Y chromosome. That's how their genome is organized. Uh, in human, I think you know there's a five RDNA loci per haploid genome, that's what we have, and each locus contains uh, about, you know, the hundreds of, you know, the ribosomal DNA copies. So that repetitiveness is critically important uh, to support our cellular, you know, the demand of ribosome biogenesis. However, the problem is if they are tandemly repeated, you can find the homology uh, between the repeating copies everywhere, right? Because that's the exact same things. So then they can easily find the homology between the different copies with each other. And if they end up with recombining over here, you lose a copy number to the extra set of, you know, chromosomal circle, and then reducing the copy number on your chromosome. And then this uh, copy number reduction uh, is known to be a, one of the major cause of the replicative senescence, at least in the East. But not much was known about what's happening in the, uh, in the, you know, the multicellular organisms. So uh, my former graduate student, Kevin Liu, uh, decided to take a look at the ribosomal DNA copy number dynamics of fluctuation during the, you know, the multiple generation of the flies and then, you know, the lifetime. So here I'm showing our DNA copy number on the X, uh, Y axis, and the X axis is the time uh, or generation. So then if you look at the, any young males, you, they typically start out with a good copy number, whatever, you know, the sufficient copy number around here. But then if you follow these flies as they age, his gonad end up is losing RDNA copy number. So that means this older father, older male, end up is having, you know, the reduced copy number. And then this, because this happens in a Gemini, what this means is that this older father end up is passing sperm DNA with reduced RDNA copy number, right? So then, you know, we could actually see this young son they are young, but their entire RDNA copy in the entire body is actually reduced. So then you can easily see that, you know, you are doomed. If this is, happen, you know, keep happening in a few generations, we'll be losing our ability to keep going, right? So obviously it hasn't happened luckily to us or flies either. And so how is it? And then, you know, one shocking observation is indeed this sun, Start, who started with the, you know, his life with a reduced copy number, 
his testes undergo recovery. So that, you know, the next generation, F2 generation from the beginning, their progeny have, you know, now okay RDNA copy number, right? So that means this there's a fluctuation of the copy number, and probably this ribosomal RDNA copy number maintenance is some sort of, you know, important aspect of the germline immortality. So then when we found this and we saw this data, and then we realized, oh, wait a minute, this part, RDNA copy number recovery, that's not unheard of. So that goes back actually 50 years, goes back by 50 years. So then back then, you know, this original discovery of this, you know, the reduced chromosome, I mean, the RDNA copy number on the certain chromosome, this mutant chromosome was discovered by Calvin Bridges, uh, you know, the century ago in the original, you know, the fly room. But then, you know, the, so later researchers, you know, the have figured sometimes, you know, the certain conditions that deduce, you know, the mutant chromosome with minimal RDNA copy number can be induced to recover the copy number. So this process has been called the RDNA magnification. And then, so that was a phenomenon back then people were studying because this is an interesting phenomenon. But back then people didn't know uh, this has any biological relevance other than this interesting mutant chromosome. Now we think this magnification is a process to recover any RDNA that, you know, that lost a copy number because of the aging, okay? Uh, and then, you know, the, probably the, the last person, the youngest person before us who studied this phenomenon is Scott Horry. And uh, we have been in touch since, you know, that we discovered this. Uh, and then, uh, so in this mechanism, right, and then we now think, you know, that this is a mechanism for the transgenerational maintenance of RDNA copy number, even in the wild type flies. And then, you know, the but good thing is prior studies figured quite a bit of the molecular mechanism, how this might happen. So that was something we really benefited by just going into the literature when we discovered this phenomenon in the wild type flies. Okay, so this is how normally flies recover the copy number. So I'm showing like about just to, you know, they exemplify and only I'm showing eight copies. Typically that's many, many more copies. But let's say if you have eight copies of ribosomal DNA, after the DNA replication, you have a sister chromatid over here. To recover the copy number, what they do is these sister chromatids misalign on purpose. They find the pair, the homology, at the misaligned location, and they go an equal sister chromatid exchange, like here. Upon resolution of unequal sister chromatid exchange, one sister chromatid steals one copies, I mean the many copies from its sister. So that means one sister chromatid recovered a copy number at the expense of its sister, right? And then when we drew this diagram, we were like completely thunderstruck. Wow, this is an asymmetry we have been looking for, right? I mean, to explain non-random sister chromatid segregation, probably it's a copy number. So we are very, very excited, and then George decided to take a look at uh, you know, the copy number difference potentially you know, the, in the stem cell division. So you know, during the stem cell division, stem cell is going to create a differentiating cell. Can we see the copy number difference? And uh, back then, we are agnostic, you know, the which copies go to which side because the stem cell is important, but differentiating cells are sperm, right? So that's also important. So which is, is going to which? We, we are kind of agnostic back then. So then, you know, we did the, you know, the DNA fish capturing, dividing stem cell. And then, you know, this is uh, what first Georgia found. This is the stem cell side, and this is, uh, going, you know, the differentiating side. If you are really trying to look any difference, so it is none, right? And then we are very disappointed. There's no difference. And then we thought, well, maybe this is beyond the resolution of our DNA fish, because if 5% difference in the copy number, that's still meaningful. But we might not see it. You know, the DNA fish is not that good. And then, you know, the, we were very disappointed about the year past. Uh, you know, maybe we can't say, uh, you know, I don't know what is the next, you know, the step of the breakthrough for this project. But then one day, you know, the George came to me. I think we have been looking at, you know, he told me, we, we have been looking at the wrong condition because this is wild type condition where cells are not tempted to increase the copy number. They are fine. 
So now, so with that idea, George went to take a look at this magnifying condition that has minimal RDN copy number. Now we start seeing the difference between the stem cell side and then differentiating side. Then stem cell was always inheriting a little bit more of the ribosomal DNA. And you can quantify. And over here, wild type situation or normal copy number situation, we see nothing. And then we do see uh, this is log scale, 1.3 times they show the difference most of the time in the, uh, once you know, that there's a magnifying condition. And I'm not sure if I would have believed this 1.3 times difference with the fish uh, if this was the first data we got. But we spent many months wanting to see something different over here. And no matter what we wanted to see, we didn't see it. After this very squeaky clean negative data, we were able to believe this. And then on top of that, this indora, right? If you mutate this indora that's required for non-random segregation, now we lose this asymmetry completely. And so this is, you know, I'm gonna come back, you know, that this is actually hinting also the indora's function. But anyway, you know, at this point, you know, indora, uh, you know, the, the mutant cannot actually do this asymmetric segregation. So, um, you know, that's what we think now. And then, uh, Okay, so just to summarize up until this point, you know, uh, this is a kind of un very unexpected meaning of non-random sister chromatid segregation. And, you know, they, we found, uh, first of all, we found RDNA and its binding protein indra is an important part of the non-random sister chromatid segregation. And then instead of all those genetic, epigenetic information, uh, distributed across the all entire chromosomes. We think it's, you know, that this element is localized, which is RDNA, and unexpectedly that's a copy number. And why they are doing it? We think it's for the sake of germline immortality or to maintain RDNA copy number through many, many generations so that they do not lose this germline's integrity. And then, by the way, Indra name, you know, the gene name Indra comes from a Hindu god who lost the immortality because of the curse. And then if I, you know, the, by the tradition of the Drosophila genetics, you have to name genes based on mutant phenotype and the Indra mutant indeed, you know, lose germline immortality. That's how we named the gene uh, Indra. Okay, so then, you know, before going to the next section of, uh, you know, the of how you know the indra might be functioning, like molecular mechanism of indra, which is fairly new, like you know, last month or so, we all of a sudden started getting really interesting data. But I want to tell you a little bit about a slightly different aspect of the magnification. Another thing that we found is you know that this is a work by postdoc Jonathan Nelson, who's heading to run his own lab at the Stony Brook sometime soon, like you know, in a few months. So. Uh, to induce this unequal sister chromatid exchange to increase the copy number, first step uh, that you have to do is actually to break the DNA, otherwise nothing will happen. And then, you know, the Jonathan found that this is actually retrotransposon that has been known to only insert into the ribosomal DNA is the actual key to induce that magnification. So that's really kind of interesting, you know, the, uh, you know, the phenomena where, you know, the genetic parasites, right, you know, the transposons are kind of co-opted or, you know, adapted and they have now symbiotic kind of relationship with a host. And, you know, when we started this, this work, you know, we are really puzzled because how come host would want any transposon to come into specifically into the most important part of your genome. And it turned out indeed um, R2 is kind of, you know, the co-opted and then to really induce this, uh, you know, the magnification only when it's required. Okay, so then now there's a little bit of question. I told you, you know, I, we were at the beginning agnostic about which cells, stem cells or differentiating cells inherit the recovery copy number. And then whenever I gave a seminar, many people came to me, hey, it doesn't make any sense. It got to, you got to be wrong because, you know, the stem cell inheriting more copies, that really doesn't make any sense because, you know, that this 
this differentiating cell makes sperm. Sperm is much more important than one generation stem cell, right? So then, you know, the, we, uh, you know, started thinking about it. But, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense because if stem cell magnifies a copy number, right, then what happens is that this stem cell is going to make differentiating cell in the next cell division again, right? Then this keeps going, you know, the differentiating cell downstream of all those populations start inheriting the recovered copy number, right? On the other hand, if one time of the, you know, the, the increased copy number goes to the differentiating cell, that this differentiating cell doesn't sustain itself, meaning when this cell differentiate, it just keep going down. And then one, one round of the magnification, you'll be done, right? And then another way to think about it is like this. So if stem cells are inheriting the recover, you know, the good copy, right? And then, you know, the red is low copy number, blue is a high copy number, you start with a kind of reddish, stem cell recovers, and then at the first, differentiating cells get the hit, right? You know, the, you lose the copy number. But the next division, stem cell recover even more. And then next round of the differentiating cell gets the, uh, you know, the, even if it's slightly decreased, that, that starting template is better than previous, right? So that means gradually stem cell increase the copy number and then differentiating cell also start recovering copy number, you know, maybe a couple of cycle be, cell cycle behind, but you can still recover the copy number. But on the contrary, if you do the opposite, stem cell keep losing the copy number to give the better copy to the differentiating cell, but the differentiating cell keep receiving the copies from stem cell that has severely reduced RDNA copy number, so that means both of them just keep decreasing the copy number. This is essentially like eating the seed cone, right? So that's what you don't want to do. And we also model this a little bit, and under normal condition, there's no copy number difference between sisters. No matter what happens, there's, you know, starting from 200 copies, I mean, you know, after many, you know, the divisions, pretty much nothing happens. But in the magnifying condition, and the uh, initial copy number is, let's say, starting from reduced 100, right? But then, you know, the sister chromatid exchange, you know, happens at the 50% in the germline right? stem cell. And then if that, you know, after the exchange, stem cells do not have any preference. Actually, you don't get any copy number increase. Some, some, some stem cells end up with increasing copy number, I mean, sorry, in a sperm, but some of them lose, right? So, so net zero increase. But if stem cells are getting the better copy, now sperm uh, start receiving much more recovered copy number. On the other hand, if stem cells are, uh, you know, they're losing the good, you know, the recovered copies, then overall sperm, you know, after two weeks, um, you know, the uh, average copy number is so much more reduced. And uh, so that really tells, I mean, this is probably unnecessary additional, uh, the monitoring, but uh, the, you know, the key message is that it is germline stem cell that undergoes magnification to increase the copy number. Uh, and then, then next question is then, you know, now we know germline stem cell undergo magnification, but is that limited to germline stem cell? Because breaking DNA is a kind of tricky business. Do you want to do that all the time, right? So that was the next thing you know, we wanted to address. So then uh, we could actually take a look at the, you know, the uh, occurrence of uh, you know, the unequal sister chromatin exchange by looking at the DNA double standard break, you know, the probe by uh, phosphorylated gamma H2A X, I mean, in Drosophila, that's it's a V. So this gamma it's a V. And in a normal condition, in this stem cell area, you barely see any, uh, you know, the, um, the DNA damage. But if you give this reduced copy number the condition, you know, the magnifying condition, you start seeing the DNA damage around here. And then this is one data to show this transposon is important. In this, you know, the magnifying condition, if you knock down this uh, transposon, uh, you know, the, you, you stop actually seeing this, you know, the uh, DNA damage, okay? 
So then, not only that, okay, this comparison, so this is comparing stem cell and then differentiating cell in a gray, and then in what condition? The control situation, magnifying condition, magnifying plus R2, this transposon inhibited. So then, by comparing this, right, so this DNA double strand break happens only when ribosomal DNA copy number is low. So there's one layer of the regulation, right? On top of that, by comparing this over here, even under magnifying condition, DNA break is pretty much limited to the stem cell, and the differentiating cells don't do it, okay? And that kind of makes sense because we previously published that differentiating cells are extremely sensitive to DNA damage to make sure their genome integrity is pretty good. So teeniest bit of the DNA damage, which doesn't do anything to the somatic cells, that's enough to kill the germ cells. Okay, and then not only our DNA breaks, R2 expression, transposon expression is also limited in the space and time. And as you can see over here, only when uh, magnifying conditions happens, like you know, the R DNA copy number is low, R2 comes out over here but then only in a stem cell, and the uh, expression in a differentiating cell is much, much more suppressed, okay? So then, uh, so one thing, you know, the, uh, we, you know, the faced, you know, the one challenge we faced when we are studying this, you know, the John faced was that often case many people are very skeptical. Well, you know, this is transposon, you know, that they got to be parasite, you don't want to do anything with it. Um, you know, uh, you know, they can't be any beneficial to the host. But we, you know, the, our data was pretty uh, convincing, we thought, uh, in terms of R2 transposon helping uh, you know, the magnification helping our DNA copy number maintenance. So next thing Jonathan did was, okay, if, if indeed R2 is a really important part of the host biology, there should be all of those signaling pathways, the host signaling pathways has to be integrated together with R2 expression. So then what he did was this, you know, the single cell RNA sequencing. And then for him, you know, the, what he did was actually compare the two conditions. First of all, he, you know, uh, he used the stem cell tumor and also he, you know, because this is single cell, he, you can isolate, you know, the, uh, you can digitally also isolate or concentrate the stem cells. And then just the stem cell, and also he compared low RDNA copy number and the high RDNA copy number situations. And then you can get the genes that's down the upregulated under the condition of low RDNA copy number. And then, so I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Downregulated in low, low RDNA copy number, these are the candidate of the inhibitor magnification. When you don't have to magnify, uh, you are not magnifying. So that's the regulator. So that gave us a couple of interesting genes. One was uh, insulin receptor. And I'm going to probably skip over, but the, I'm going to just tell you uh, that's pretty convincing. You know, the, if you modulate this, you know, insulin nutrient sensing pathway, and then that completely, you know, the regulates uh, this magnification. That means we think, you know, that this is probably cells are sensing, you know, the cells ability to make lots of ribosome. And if that's compromised, that stream to the insulin receptor pathway, and then uh, that you know that tells R2 to express or not. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna get into the too much of the detail. I mean, oh yeah, oh actually I don't have it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so then that's one thing, you know, the insulin receptor, and then we use the insulin receptor mutant and then constitutive active, dominant negative, etc. It all told us insulin receptor is. Uh, negatively regulating the magnification process. So that means even when they want to magnify, if you activate insulin pathway, cells don't care, and then they do not magnify at all. So for example, another thing was very nice, pi RNA pathway uh, was pulled out, and that's also repressor. That, of course, makes sense, right? Why do you have pi RNA pathway to repress transposon? But it's not just to repress. I would say, I would rephrase this to fine tune the transposon instead of just to depress, right? When you don't need a transposon to come out, of course you are depressing it, but that is because cells has a situation when you won't have a little bit of uh, the transposon to come out. That's why, you know, the pyrene passage becomes handy. 
Okay, now I'm going to tell you a little bit, you know, in the last few minutes, tell you function of Indra, right? And then, you know, we, you know, we know Indra binds to ribosomal DNA. It's required for non random segregation and required for magnification. But exactly how does that work? And then that's George's, you know, the recent work, I mean, in the last two months or so. So this one, I told you, right, it's the same thing, you know, the asymmetry of the copy number in a you know, normal condition, magnifying condition, and magnifying but intermutant condition. So this one, as you can see, there's no asymmetry at all. That suggested us. Indra is not actually required for segregation per se, but I, with, I, it's actually required for creating the asymmetry, right? Because if it's simply required for segregation, you might create, sorry, lots of copy number asymmetry, but you might go to the random way. Sorry, I just fabricated this data by copying and flipping this from this data last night to show what you would expect if you're, you know, you are making that copy number asymmetry, but they are not segregating correctly, right? So that, you know, that this doesn't happen, so that means Indra was probably required for creating the copy number asymmetry. So then, so as I told you, the in, uh, you know, briefly mentioned, Indra actually binds to this one specific sequence, IGS. That's one promoter of ribosomal DNA gene. Curiously, people have known RDNA have two promoters. One is IGS and the other one is ETS. Why do you need two promoters, right? Uh, and then, but because it's a promoter, we decided to take a look. You know, the Indra has any function in the expression of IGS. And then it turned out indeed, yes, you know, in a wild type condition, you get a little bit of IGS expression, but in the indoor mutant, it gets really upregulated over here. And then if you uh, do this, you know, the first of all, um, uh, over here, yeah, you can see that indoor mutant upregulates considerably IGS. Interestingly, this upregulation is very specific to stem cell. This is indoor mutant. Still, this upregulation is observed only in a stem cell, but not in a differentiating cell. So that means whatever the tendency to express IGS, that itself is already limited to the germline stem cell. When you remove the indoor, I mean, so this also tells us indoor is probably uh, the transcriptional repressor, right? But that, you know, the indra is repressing the expression, but the ability to express at all is kind of limited to the stem cell, but not the differentiating cell. And, you know, that this, we don't observe any of the upregulation if you look at the other, you know, other part of the rDNA, like this one I'm showing ITS, but ETS, this promoter is the same. There's no upregulation at all in these guys. Okay, so IGS regulation by indra is stem cell specific, and then, uh, Indra seems to be a repressor, but what, what does that do? Then, you know, the, we took a hint a little bit from East. In case of East, right, you know, the IGS happens, you know, the IGS is over here in between the RDNA copies, just like Drosophila. And then normally it's also repressed. However, when cells lose a copy number, what happens is IGS indeed gets upregulated. What this result is that if you express so much from here, and then right here there's a DNA replication origin. There is a conflict of transcription and the DNA replication that end up is breaking DNA. And then that DNA break is actually used to do the sister chromatid exchange to increase the copy number. So we saw, and then, okay, transplanting this idea to what we know in Drosophila, of course, you know, the, Indra is over here. Now we started thinking, or oh, maybe Indra is repressing normally to depress the magnification. So that became the idea. So we tested this idea, and then uh, we first take a look at the, you know IGS expression in a wild type of situation versus you know the magnifying condition. This is this is not the Indra mutation. And then you know the, if you look at over here, uh, the stem cell. Uh, you know, the actual upregulated IGS over here and the magnifying condition, right? Compared to the normal condition, you get the upregulation. And if you compare, if you actually normalize the IGS expression by 
differentiating cell, you know, the um, stem cell divided by differentiating cell, it gets even clearer, right? Just the stem cell express IGS when you need to magnify our DNA copy number. Okay, so then another important thing is if you overexpress Indra, now you can suppress it. So that really tells us Indra is a negative regulator of IGS expression. That leads to the next question, does Indra repress a magnification, right? And then we also, I, I'm not gonna show you today, I think, and I don't have a slide for it. We also discovered Indra protein amount itself actually goes down during magnification. So that means, you know, Indra protein amount is sensitive to, uh, you know, the RDNA copy number. Okay. So then, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, as all expected, magnifying condition, you observe the DNA break in a stem cell. If you overexpress uh, Indra, you repress it. Same thing, you know, the, this is, a, uh, you know, the frequency of magnification. Magnifying condition, of course, shoots up the magnification. You overexpress Indra, you're gonna repress it, right? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, so uh, actually this is the data. So uh, the indoor amount actually goes down when you know, the cells lose the RDNA copy number. Okay, so then uh, is that just a replication transcription conflict that's happening over here, right, like yeast? But another thing I just told you is that this is upstream of the gene, right, RDNA gene. On top of that, that has a R2 insertion. Right? I mean, then, you know, the Indra is a transcriptional regulator of the R2 as well. That became a question. And then perhaps actually Indra is repressing R2 expression as well. And indeed, that's the case. Indra mutant upregulate the R2. And also, when, you know, in magnifying condition, R2 should be up, but that can be repressed by overexpressing, you know, the Indra. Okay, so then this actually led to the sort of unifying model. Previously, this is what people knew. So when people thought R2 is a purely parasite, bad guy, people have figured actually, uh, you know, the RDNA inserted with R2 is completely depressed by unknown mechanism. Perhaps by RNA, but anyway, that it was clear RDNA inserted by R2 is not expressing at all. And the only good, good copy uh, is expressed now upstream additional promoter came into the picture. That is IGS, bound by Indra. Now we think this is what's happening. Under magnifying condition, I mean, this, this promoter is always repressed, you know, under normal condition, so this normally doesn't count. Only transcription is happening by using this promoter ETS over here. That is a normal condition. But now, under magnifying condition, when cells lose RDNA copy number, as I said, Indra gets downregulated, so you lose Indra. Now, this new promoter come into picture, right? And then we think this expression from IGS is non-discriminatory, whether it's inserted with R2 or not. This probably results in R2 expression that leads to the magnification through an equal sister chromatid exchange. That's what we think. And then that's essentially the entire message, I mean, to lead to magnification. Let me give you just one, uh, you know, the surprise. So this model says, oh, you know, because RDNA is typically transcribed by, uh, you know, the RNA polymerase one, right? What about the second promoter who's doing it? Because if all same polymerase is coming into these two different promoters, I mean, there's not much of the differential regulation you could do, right? So turn now, this IGS upregulation under magnifying condition is entirely up to polymerase two or alpha amanitin sensitive. And then, uh, that's, yeah, kind of, this is kind of busy data, but one shocking, this is much more visually appealing, so I'm gonna show you. So this is just a simple immunofluorescence Okay, you know, looking at the RNA polymerase 2 in a viral type, this is boring, right? Yeah, of course it's nucleus, right? Uh, when you give the, this magnifying condition, when RDNA copy number goes down, all of a sudden, RNA polymerase come around the nucleolus, that's a RDNA synthesis, you know, the factory, right? So we think, you know, that all of a sudden, when RDNA copy number goes down, 
RNA polymerase two gets recruited to IGS, and then that is that's that's possible because Indra, you know, that goes away and then allows Pol two to come in. So. Uh, to summarize, uh, you know, the, today's talk, so R I told you RDNA locus is actually very vulnerable, although it's super important to maintain our, you know, the cell's health because, you know, that you lose the copy number all the time. You have to recover to maintain the germline immortality to last 1.5 billion years of the multicellular life. And to do so, I mean, this recovery is mediated by an equal sister chromatid exchange, and that is the real key, right, to rejuvenate ribosomal DNA in the germline. And then I also told you that is done in a stem cell. This is happening specifically in the germline stem cell, so which I really, you know, like. And then that is mediated by programmed DNA break, which involves a transposon, and also this, you know, the uh, the activation of the specific promoter that, you know, that brings in a RNA polymerase too. Okay, so then that leads to differential copy number, which leads to, or, you know, the, which is further, you know, the, um, regulated by non-random sister chromatid segregation to allow the stem cell to inherit the better copy number. So with that, uh, I hope you got a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, the how Jamra is maintaining its, you know, the immortality. And then, the, so this is my lab. And, uh, you know, the indoor part was done by George Watase. It took really 10 years, but I think, you know, we are, both of us are very happy. We, f we feel, finally, we figured it out. And then R2 part was done by Jonathan Nelson, helped by his technician, Alisa Sriko, over here. And then thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Indra has to be repressed, repressed to have magnification. But Indra is also important for bias segregation. Right. You don't want, you know, like uh, Indra, right. but you... So, yes, so you're right. And then for longest time, we thought Indra was required for segregation per se. Yeah. But I think, you know, the, what happening in Indra is that, uh, you know, the, in the absence of Indra, I just express so much. Actually, they end up with recombining many, many times. Mm -hmm. So then that equalized to sister chromatide, and then that's why cells get confused which strand to bring to the stem cell. So Indra does not seem to be the actual machinery to segregate the DNA. But that, of course, brings the next point, you know, the next subject, right? I mean, we have to really study how, yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> cell, you know, the, you know, the divisional apparatus is differentiating one copy from the other. That is yeah. still a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Yes. That was fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I have a really general evolutionary question. So if you have 200 copies of a gene, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, it seems like per gene there's really low um, selection pressure to keep that mm -hmm. consistent. So it, how, how does that work? Is there any difference in the um, mutation rates right. at so the ends versus the middle? When, yeah, exactly. So typically, you know, the middle copies are well maintained. Oh, okay. And that is because... Actually, that is because of unequal sister chromatid exchange. Because if you, you know, the, if you do this unequal sister chromatid exchange over here, right, middle copy gets duplicated, right? right. As a uh -huh. result, they actually homogenize middle copy. If you go to the end, that same thing with, for example, centromeric saturated DNA, right? Everyone, any repetitive DNA, Toward the end, you know, that you study sequence start degrading, but in the middle, it is, uh, you know, the pretty well conserved. And so that means if anything get the mutation, that's gonna sweep the most of the, you know, the middle part of the segment. And then in case of RDNA, if you mutate in a way that you, that's gonna compromise our, our, our DNA function, right? And then, of course, you know, that's gonna be selected out. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, that was a great talk. Can, um, is, how much of this is conserved in females? So, super question. Uh, we actually ha have not been able to really do the co-fish in a female, but there is a really interesting observation from 50 years ago. Female does not undergo magnification. So, 
that's really interesting. Why is it? We don't know. Yeah, yeah. But a female doesn't do it. Yeah. Hey, Yukiko, that was really fantastic. So I'm just curious, since you raised the specter of centromere alpha satellite, mm -hmm. is there any role for Indra and mitosis at non-RDNA repeats, or is it really specific just for RDNA? Um, it really looks like it's just RDNA. And so I mean, why, yeah. so I was yeah, puzzled by that. Why is it so specific for RDNA? Yeah, we don't know. So with this, we don't know about Indra. But there's one new gene that we started working on, and we started working on this gene because that was expected to interact with other satellite DNA binding proteins, which is other wing of our lab that we are interested. And this gene binds to satellite DNA binding proteins, like you know, like D1 prod, which is right. like AATT binding protein, or that's a satellite binding protein. But this protein binds to all satellite DNA plus ribosomal DNA. <laughs> what it does over there, we don't know yet. We just started working on it. But I think there should be some sort of interesting connection there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a couple questions from online. Yes. My trouble with the first one is I don't know what the pronoun it now means. This came in just when the Q&A started. The question is, does it happen in human germ cells as well? You know, that's, I love to know that. Uh, I mean, I think just by logically deducing, it has to be happening, right? I mean, as, I mean, we are still, you know, we haven't lost our DNA copies yet, obviously. Mm. But then, you know, the human, as well as mouse spermatogonial stem cells, they are believed to divide symmetrically, okay? Um, because you can, I mean, when you identify spermatogonial stem cell, they don't exhibit any any sign that they are dividing symmetrically, I mean, asymmetrically in terms of the fate, right? And then if you, you know, people have done lots of lineage tracing and the modeling using rodent uh, spermatogonial stem cell, and they say, oh, they are just dividing symmetrically because, you know, the some stem cell, any stem cell will be lost sporadically, and then some other cells take over and it becomes stem cells. So, you know, the fate is very plastic. You know, that whether you are stem cell or spermatogonial, I mean, spermatogonia doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. That's been what's said for a very long time. But if you think about our DNA copy number, that's not a part of the fate, right? If you have a little bit of more or less, you know, copy number, still, you know, you, you have the same transcription, you know, the network, et cetera, you identify them as an equal stem cell. But of course, I, 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 I bet there should be some population that's doing this, right? Increasing the copy number. And then there's a beauty in repeatedly doing this because if you go to, let's say, you are supposed to have 200 copies, and then if you go down to 50, if you do only one, one, one you know, the division, you might recover to only 60, and then that's it. But once cells can do repeatedly, 60 becomes 70, becomes 80, and et cetera, in one generation, you can really recover a lot. So that kind of reasoning makes me wonder, I think you know, in, if you are able to look at the RDNA copy number, I think you know, the human stem cell, human spermatogonial stem cell should be dividing asymmetrically. So, so that, that would be my guess. Okay, one more question from online. Is pole two mm -hmm. used for making ribosomes or to serve another purpose? So typically, uh, pole two is not believed to do any transcription, I mean, for rRNA, right? So that's, I mean, that's been known. But not many people have really looked at uh, different conditions. And then there's one paper that said during stress condition, that stress is like, I, I don't remember, it's a heat shock or that kind of stress. It's not the low copy number stress. But upon, uh, you know, the low copy, I mean, sorry, the stress condition, actually, the RNA polymerase 2 was observed to come into the nucleolus. So, but at that point, POR2 transcribed rRNA. Is that actually, actual, you know, that becomes ribozyme? That I don't know. Yeah. Please. Um, I, I have a question, and I hope this doesn't just mean that I didn't synthesize all the parts. But I thought from your cofish at the beginning, yeah. that was not against the RDNA <gasps> locus, right? Yeah, exactly. 
Is the method of magnification like <laughs> strand specific so that the longer one is always going to end know, up on one strand? I know. Oh my or? gosh. Yeah. I hope actually I do have a, the slide about it. I typically keep that slide somewhere. Oh, I don't have it. So, uh, yes. So, f first, when we discovered non random segregation, it's actually wild type, not even magnifying condition. How come? exact same copy number supposedly is still segregating non-randomly, right? right? So, and then, you know, the, indeed, I actually almost, you know, the skipped the one critical information when I said, oh, when we realized that was asymmetry in a copy number. To be much more precise, actually, that is an asymmetry in a propensity of increase in copy number. So that means, uh, in, so what do we think is that because RDNA, it, it's known that the RDNA is replicated in a unidirectional way because of replication fork block. Because of that, for specifically for RDNA locus, one strand is primarily synthesized as a leading strand. The jazz are always lagging strand. And in case of East, and the East, there's no asymmetric cell division. Nobody detected any, you know, I mean, which copy goes to which side. But you know, in case of East, uh, you know, the typically break happens at the mm -hmm. leading strand. And if you actually, if you drew the draw the cartoon, you will see if you leading strand breaks, you cannot go beyond the replication fork. Bef you know, the where where replication is not completed because if you break and then try to search the homology beyond the fork, you end up with breaking chromosome. Only way you can repair without the breaking chromosome is at the double strand break at the leading strand, you have to go back. If you go back, you are increasing copy number. So if somebody asks me to bet, I think leading strand is going to the stem cell. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, again, you know, it's just a pure speculation based on what would make sense. <laughs> we don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Any? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.